Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the worship of our Lord today. We're focusing today on Jesus' call to us as his followers. And our call to worship relates to that as we hear from the Proverbs writer in Proverbs 8 as we hear wisdom's call to us and as we know Jesus is God's wisdom incarnate. Let's hear God's call this morning. Does not wisdom call out? Does not understanding raise her voice? At the highest point along the way, where the paths meet, she takes her stand. Beside the gate leading into the city, at the entrance she cries aloud, To you, O people, I call out. I raise my voice to all mankind. You who are simple, gain prudence. You who are foolish, set your hearts on it. Listen, for I have trustworthy things to say. I open my lips to speak what is right. My mouth speaks what is true, for my lips detest wickedness. All the words of my mouth are just. None of them is crooked or perverse. To the discerning, all of them are right. They are upright to those who have found knowledge. Choose my instruction instead of silver, knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is more precious than rubies and nothing you desire can compare with her. In response to God's call for wisdom and obedience, let's give obedience to him and praise to him now with our songs of praise as we begin with The River Is Here, and then we'll also sing Knowing You, and as we regularly do, I invite you to stand as we sing together.
Brothers and sisters in the Lord, the God who calls us to follow Him and obey Him in Jesus Christ greets us all this morning with these words, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the powerful working of His Holy Spirit who calls us and makes us one. Amen. Let's continue our praise of our God as we sing together, Jesus, draw me close. Next week, we are blessed to finally be able to celebrate the Lord's Supper together as a church family. And as we regularly do, we take time to prepare our hearts and to examine our lives for that special meal. And so to do that, I invite you to join me in our preparatory for communion litany. And you'll find the words of response on the screen. As we prepare to celebrate Holy Communion, let us remember that Scripture calls us to examine ourselves before God. We are taught that eating and drinking unworthily brings judgment upon ourselves. Let us therefore ask God for the proper spirit in which to celebrate the sacrament. Almighty God, before whom can be neither secret thought nor hidden deed, grant you us your spirit that we may know our hearts, our lives, and our inmost thoughts as you know them. Grant us your grace that we may repent sincerely of all sin, find peace with you through our Lord Jesus Christ, and grow in assurance of salvation in him. The celebration of our Savior's infinite love and his redeeming death bring joy to us and glory to you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the atoning power of our Savior's death and for our share in his victory over sin. Open our hearts as we prepare for this celebration, that it may strengthen us in our faith, establish us in our hope, and confirm us in our love. In his name, amen. Brothers and sisters, let us first examine our faith. We all confess the truth of God as taught by Scripture and summarized in the creeds of the church. By this faith, we take to ourselves Christ and all his benefits so that for us to live is Christ. Lord God, author and finisher of all true believing, confirm our faith as we prepare for the Holy Sacrament. Let us further examine our hope. All Christian hope rests upon the finished work of Christ as Savior. The Holy Gospel teaches that all our righteousness is in Him alone. God's children rely wholly upon the merits of Christ Find in him their strength and victory, and confidently expect his return in glory. They look forward to celebrating this holy supper anew with him in his kingdom. They will surely be received by God at his table. Most merciful Father, fill us with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may abound in hope. And let us also examine our love both for God and our neighbors. Remember the first and great commandment to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let us consciously determine to live a life of loving service to Him through Christ our Lord. Let us also search ourselves to determine whether we love our neighbors as Christ commands. Do we unselfishly live for the welfare of others? Do our lives reflect the godly virtues of obedience, fidelity, integrity, Justice, humility, and contentment? 
Do we seek reconciliation with our neighbors in all cases of offense? Dear Father, daily increase in us the greatest gift of all, our Christian love. If these marks of spiritual life are not evident in us, we may not presume to approach his table. Those, therefore, who live in self-righteousness, who hope in works or virtues of their own, and who do not show love to God and neighbor, have no true place at the Lord's Supper. Yet we should not be deterred by any sin lingering within against our will. As we find faith, hope, and love within us, we ought gladly to obey our Lord's command and come with full expectation to God's open house of mercy. Gracious God, we love and adore you in Christ our Lord. We thank you for reconciling us to yourself in him. We rejoice in being received as your children. Prepare us by your Holy Spirit for the sacrament. Help us to come in the assurance that by it we shall be spiritually revived and strengthened in faith, hope, and love. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And I have a few announcements uh, to share with you this morning. Reminder about our worship times, uh, 9.30 and evening service at 5 o'clock. Grace Fellowship will be worshiping today again at 11 and 6.30. Offering this morning is for uh, ministry shares. And if you haven't done so yet, you can put your offering in the offering plates in the back of the sanctuary. We'll be meeting for coffee and fellowship downstairs in the fellowship hall after the morning service, as we've been doing the past several weeks. Sunday school meets again today after the morning service, and children and adults are invited to come and join us. Again, a reminder about the search team asking us to pray for them as they have now started to meet. Please give names of possible lead pastor candidates to members of the search team. And again, our search team includes Von Blackwire, Pearl Heisinger, Marcia Hooksma, Wes Vanderlucht, and Ed Walters. Council continues to ask the congregation for persons to be nominated uh, uh, for the office of elder and deacon. They just actually just asked for that this week. There will be a box in the back of the sanctuary to put names in, so keep that in mind in the coming days. Council also continues to seek applications for the administrative assistant position. Some experience with Microsoft Office is necessary, and if you're interested in that position, please contact Roger Brower. The council also continues to seek applications for a custodian position. Anyone interested in this position, please contact Bob Clunder. And again, note the prayer requests and food donation needs for the bridge that are listed in our bullet. I encourage you to check those out and to give and pray accordingly. Let's draw near to God in prayer. Father, we are so grateful to gather today again on this Sunday morning on this day of some snow and, and another day of winter, we're grateful, Father, that we can gather here. And God, we're grateful that not only can we gather here in person, but we're grateful again for the opportunity to gather virtually for, for those that are doing that. We are grateful, Lord, that through technology we can connect by worship even over the Internet. We're grateful, Father, for that tool. Dear Father, we're grateful that you are a God who calls us. You, you called us to come to worship today, and we're grateful that we can do that either in person or virtually. And we're grateful, Lord, that you call us each day to come and to follow you. We're grateful, Father, that uh, most of us here can testify to the fact that at some point in our life, Jesus came and called us to follow him, and, and we did. We took up our cross, and, and we have been following him ever since as our Lord and our Savior. And we're grateful, Father, that you continue to renew your call to us, and we can take up your, our cross, and we can follow your call and follow you wherever you lead us. We're grateful, Lord, that you give us the strength and the courage to continue to follow you each day both when the road is easy and when the road gets more difficult. And Father, we are grateful that we can encourage one another, not only with words of encouragement, not only with being together, but also by praying for one another. And so, Lord, we draw near to you with our prayer request this morning as we do each week and every day. 
Father, we pray again for our schools. We pray for the students, teachers, and administrators as they meet together at school. We pray your blessing on the uh, in-class and virtual classes that are going on. Lord, bless each person. Continue to pray for our church staff, Father. Uh, bless them and their roles. We pray your blessing as we continue to seek a new administrative assistant and custodian. God, we pray also for our council elders and deacons. Lord, guide them and the decisions that they continue to make. We lift up guidance and prayers for the search team. And that, Lord, you would bring to mind candidates that would be a good fit here in this church. We pray that your continued leading in that whole process. We pray, Father, for our ministries as they have resumed. We pray for Sunday school as it meets today and for gems and cadets as they have begun meeting now. We pray for adult Bible study as it also continues to meet and also coffee break as they have also continued to meet. We're grateful, Lord, for each ministry. We're grateful for each leader and for each person that participates. And Father, we pray that we would be able to be a part of these ministries and to be encouraged in our call uh, as we engage in these ministries that you have given us. And dear Lord, we pray for the leadership of our country again. We pray for President Biden, for Congress, for the Supreme Court. We pray for Governor Whitmer and for our state legislature. We pray, Father, also for uh, Mayor Kleinster. We pray for our city council. And dear Lord, we uh, pray for states and countries that are dealing with a resurgence of the coronavirus. We pray that the virus can be brought under control. We continue to pray for our health care workers who continue to deal with the stress and the long hours and the risk of getting COVID. And dear Father, we pray for the distribution of COVID vaccines to be more efficient and that they would get to the most vulnerable people in a timely fashion. We pray that that can be done even better. And dear Lord, we say a special prayer today for uh, Gord Bukema as he is in Florida and as he has been diagnosed with, with COVID. We're grateful, Lord, that uh, he is recovering. We pray for his continued recovery, and we pray for him as he finishes his time in the hospital, and we pray also for uh, Hanky as well, that you would uh, give them all that they stand in need of, and that soon he would fully recover from this. And we, we certainly pray for all others that are dealing with this virus right now. Dear Lord, we pray that you would bless us as we uh, continue our worship this morning, and we bring our prayers to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts for hearing God's word as we still our hearts before him and sing together, be still and know that I am God. Let's rise to sing together. This morning we're looking at the theme of answering Jesus' call, and our scripture comes from Mark 1, verses 14 through 20, and as we get ready to 
recite these verses together. Let's ask God to bless that word to our hearts. Please join me in prayer. Father, we're grateful that we can hear your call this morning, and we thank you, Lord, that we have the privilege this morning of, of looking at Mark's account of Jesus' calling of his first disciples as Jesus begins his ministry. We pray, Father, your blessing on these words and on these scriptures, and Lord, may they renew your call to us, and may we be faithful to that call as we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Please join me as we read together Mark 1, 14 through 20. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is God's word to us this morning. You may be seated. Dear family in the faith, Pastor N.T. Wright asks us to imagine that you are sitting quietly in a cafe with a couple of friends when suddenly the door bursts open and in rushes a stranger with a wild, excited look on his face. Good news, he shouts. You'll never guess the greatest news that you could ever imagine. What on earth can he be talking about? What could this good news be, and why does he think it justifies barging into a cafe and telling strangers about it? Here are three possible scenarios. Scenario one, perhaps the doctors just told him that they had managed to cure his daughter of the disease that was killing her. That would be great news indeed, at least for his immediate family and friends. But it doesn't explain why he would announce it to strangers. Scenario two, perhaps he heard that the local football team had won a great victory against their old rivals down the road. Some parts of my own country, he says, people would indeed celebrate such a thing as good news. Though most fans probably would be at the pub watching the game with him. Why leave the celebration to tell non-fans at a cafe? Scenario three. Perhaps in a region with high unemployment and poverty, he just learned that people uh, have found huge new reserves of coal, gas, and oil. Suddenly there would be thousands of new jobs and good news for everyone, a new start for everyone. He says, I know places that would cause otherwise quiet people to burst into a room and shout the news to everybody. That might justify such a dramatic announcement. Well, N.T. Wright goes on to compare how each of these three scenarios is like the good news of the gospel. In each scenario, one, the news isn't just something that happened out of the blue, like the gospel of Jesus. Each scenario assumes a larger context. Two, the news is about something that happened because of which everything will now be different, like the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Three, in each scenario, the news introduces an intermediate period of waiting that is filled with hope. A waiting period that we're in right now as Jesus has come and we're waiting for him to return. During the rest of the church season of Epiphany, which focuses on God's glory seen in Jesus' early life and ministry, we're going to be focusing on the events of Jesus' ministry recorded in Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. We'll also be looking at some events from Mark's Gospel during the first two Sundays of the season of Lent, which begins already next month. 
Mark's gospel begins in chapter 1, verse 1, with the announcement. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. I agree with other scholars who believe that this beginning isn't just referring to the start of Mark's gospel account. Instead, this beginning is referring to the spread of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's Son. This good news about Jesus starts to be spread by the ministry of John the Baptist. According to Mark 1, verse 4, John preaches a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He preaches to the crowds that gather at the Jordan River of the imminent coming of the Messiah who will baptize them not merely with water as he does, but with the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus himself is baptized by John. As Jesus comes up out of the water, the Holy Spirit anoints Jesus, alighting on him in the form of a dove. Heavenly voice, God the Father, announces who this uh, Jesus is in Mark 1, verse 11. He says, you are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Jesus is then tempted by Satan in the wilderness so that he's spiritually prepared to begin his ministry. Jesus proves that he's ready to both live and proclaim the good news about himself by overcoming Satan's temptations. With a summary of the gospel's initial proclamation, spread, and preparation, we now come to our scripture for today. And it begins with Jesus preaching the coming of God's kingdom. Commentator Scott Jose points out that the opening 13 verses of Mark 1 are like the overture before the start of a play. With verse 14, the curtain starts going up on the drama of the good news of Jesus Christ. And when the curtain goes up, we see Galilee. After John the Baptist is imprisoned by King Herod, we read in verse 14 that Jesus went to Galilee. We're not in a bigger city like Jerusalem or Sephorus or Rome. Nope. Just little old Galilee. Today it would be like expecting some drama to unfold in New York City or Los Angeles only to have the story zero in on some place called Outbank, North Dakota. It's probably a nice place, but it sure wasn't the place that we expected. These days, some refer to the heartland of the U.S. as flyover country. No vacations there, but you fly over it on airplanes, bringing you to more exciting destinations. That's the reaction Galilee might have garnered from the sophisticates of Jesus' day. It's not the kind of happening place where one would expect a great drama to unfold. But as the curtain goes up on the active phase of Jesus' ministry, that is the place where we find ourselves. In this backwater place called Galilee, we're told that Jesus proclaims the good news of God, saying, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Turns out that Jesus' message isn't unique. He basically tears a page out of his cousin John's playbook and repeats his message. John had been saying, repent. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven has come near. We thought John was the warm-up act. He said so himself. So why is the main character, Jesus, reprising all that again? Jesus calls this announcement good news, but at the precise moment that the story begins, the message itself is sufficiently thin on its content to make it difficult to discern what's so good about it. The kingdom, we're told, has come near. It's not here. It's not yet fulfilled. It's not crashing into the dim and sometimes grim realities of the world and 
nor is it doing anything overt to solve something as locally important as removing the Romans that are now occupying Israel. Something appears to be up, something's in the wind. But just what that something is, well, we're not told. I believe the reason why Jesus repeats the gospel message of John the Baptist is because he has now taken on the mantle of preaching the good news of God's kingdom. Jesus preaching G John's message shows how the good news of God's approaching kingdom continues to be spread not only from person to person, but also from preacher to preacher. Later in Mark chapter 6, Mark tells us that Jesus sends out his 12 disciples, his apostles, to deliver people from impure spirits and to preach the same message for people to repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. Luke tells us in chapter 10 of his gospel that Jesus finally sends out 72 of his followers to heal people and to preach the exact same message. The kingdom of God has come near to you. Repent. Jesus' own ministry illustrates Jesus' own parable of the mustard seed that Mark records in Mark 4, verses 30 through 32. What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. The coming of Jesus the Messiah ushers in God's growing kingdom on earth and the spread of the gospel good news. Christianity Today columnist David Neff observes that God loves the potential small things, including the gospel and his kingdom. He says, is our gospel too small? From what Jesus says, I think that God likes small. Small and hidden, actually. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It is like yeast. It is like a perfect pearl. It's like finding just one lost sheep or just one lost coin. It belongs to little children and to others who were small in the estimation of Jesus' contemporaries. God likes small beginnings. He likes to work in hidden ways that are easily overlooked. He loves any lost individual even when 99% of the others are safely under his care. He passionately cares for the socially unimportant whom others trample as they rush toward worldly dominance. Small does not mean insignificant or of no consequence. Indeed, the good news of Jesus Christ is the most consequential news bulletin in the history of the world. And the individuals for whom he died are, as the old Sunday school song says, his precious jewels. To illustrate, consider, he says, tapas. Maybe some of you have had the opportunity to eat tapas. Those are the small portions of intensely flavored dishes that have long served as appetizers in Spain. Over the last quarter century, they have been, become an entire cuisine in some American restaurants. First time friends invited me to a tapas restaurant, he says, I was not intrigued. It was the 1980s, and American culture still celebrated the all-you-can-eat buffet. The idea of going to a restaurant to eat small portions didn't seem special to me. But my first tapas bites were a revelation, an epiphany. The intense tastes of garlic or cumin or chilies brought such a rush of flavor that it reoriented my whole approach to eating. This was food that could not be wolfed down unthinkingly like the 1950s American cuisine of my youth, tuna noodle casserole, jello salad, mashed potatoes. These little dishes demanded that I nibble slowly, chew thoughtfully, and savor. Here the parable of the tapas menu. God offers us something that could have been small, obscure, and forgettable. He didn't offer us some grand universal principle. 
His gift was the life and death and resurrection of just one person in one small country, repeatedly crushed and occupied by foreign powers. He does not give us love or peace or brotherhood. He gives us Jesus, who died like a common criminal. But when we pay attention to the small thing God gives us, it changes our entire approach to life. We see the world differently. What had seemed insignificant now demands our full attention. What had seemed ordinary now seems interesting. What had seemed dead now offers great potential, the redemption of the whole world. So that is the kingdom that Jesus preaches. And now we come to the second part of our scripture where Jesus calls Simon, Andrew, James, and John to fish for people. After Mark tells us that Jesus continues to spread the gospel message that John began, he moves the story forward to the Sea of Galilee, the heart-shaped lake that is seven miles wide and 13 miles long, the only freshwater lake in the Middle East. The Sea of Galilee is a thriving fishing industry with 16 ports and several towns on its northwest shore named for the fishing trade. Like Bethsaida, which means house of the fisher, and Magdala, which means fish tower. Fish from the Sea of Galilee were not only shipped to local markets, but around the Roman world, to places like Alexandria, Egypt, and Antioch, Syria. Jesus walks along the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, probably near the town of Capernaum. He sees Simon, whom he later renames Peter, and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake from the shore because they're fishermen. Jesus calls them to follow him in verse 17. Come follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. Jesus is normal than Jesus is different than normal Jewish rabbis. Rabbis don't typically call students to follow them in their teaching. Instead, students typically seek them out so that they can learn God's law and imitate that rabbi's godly life. Jesus instead calls his followers to walk in his footsteps and carry on his message. Jesus' call for these men to fish for people it's a curious phrase. They would become people fishers, anglers for human beings. It's a clever way to connect their current occupation with what Jesus has in mind for their future. It's in that sense, if you forgive the pun, a good hook to get the attention of these men. Maybe had they been construction workers, Jesus would have invited them to become builders of human hearts. Maybe had they been real estate agents, he would have invited them to become sellers of kingdom turf. The source of the metaphor is obvious enough. They are fishermen, and so Jesus uses a fishing metaphor to address them. What Simon and Andrew understand from the metaphor is harder to discern. Fishing had been the source of their livelihood up to that time. Was Jesus promising them a more lucrative way to make money? Not likely. Jesus doesn't look like a person that can dole out riches. But maybe he does look like someone else who offered these men a chance to bring people into that kingdom whose nearness Jesus had been talking about ever since arriving in Galilee. Maybe the thought of reeling folks into that better place is just intriguing enough as to have been part of what motivated these men to start modeling their lives and the life of this man that they had not previously known but who seemed to believe in a future greater than they could imagine at that present moment. Simon and, Peter, Simon and Andrew immediately leave their nets and follow Jesus. A little farther down the shore, Jesus sees James and his brother John, the sons of Zebedee, in a boat preparing their net for another round of fishing. We know from Luke's gospel that James and John are Simon's fishing partners. 
We also know from John's gospel that we talked about first Sunday of the year that Simon and Andrew and John have been introduced to Jesus before. But now is the time that Jesus officially calls them to follow him as their teacher and master. Jesus calls James and John just as he called Simon and Andrew. And immediately they leave their father Zebedee in the fishing boat with the hired men and they also go and follow Jesus. Why does Mark focus on calling these four simple fishermen to follow him? Smelling of fish and looking every bit like the working class folks that they are, Simon, Andrew, James, and John hitch their wagons to Jesus' still nondescript program and begin to follow him. Jesus doesn't tell them where they're going. Beyond his cryptic phrase to become people fishers, he also doesn't tell these four the specifics about what they might expect to happen next. He certainly doesn't promise them riches or rewards or anything tangible whatsoever. Yet, they follow, but they're doing so is hardly the stuff of great promise at this point. It's both striking and revealing that Mark's version of the gospel story gets off to such a humble, modest start. Especially notice that compared to the other gospels. Matthew has his mysterious star in the east and the magi who follow it to Bethlehem. Luke gives us layer upon layer of drama surrounding the birth and the appearance of Jesus. John brings us to the rim of the galaxies and the beginning of all things with that all-creating word of God who was with God in the beginning. But not Mark. Mark allows Jesus just to appear from out of nowhere, emerging humbly from the heat vapors emanating from the desert floor to be baptized by John. And then at the very moment when we do expect the curtain to rise and the drama to come, we end up in Galilee as Jesus starts to cobble together a set of followers that can be described only and probably at best as ragtag. I agree with Scott Jose, Tom Long, and other commentators to believe that Mark starts his gospel of Jesus the way he does, to describe the, beginnings of, the humble beginnings of Jesus' gospel ministry that will finally grow to impact not only the entire Roman Empire, but the entire world, and then all of creation itself, beyond. We find Jesus speaking his first words in Galilee. Because this is the place that is consistent with the humble beginning of Jesus' gospel ministry. And the truth is, Galilee is the place where most of us live. Most of us don't live in citadels of power or in the glare of the bright Klieg lights of history. No, we live in the Galilees of this world. On the margins, in those places where the powers that be don't visit and that they don't know much about, as likely as not. We start in Galilee because the Galilees of this life and the simple fisher folk who live there are the places and people that Jesus came to save. And so when we come to the gospel's climax and we listen to the angel's words to the women at the now empty tomb of Jesus in Mark 16, verse 7, the angel says, you must go to Galilee and there you will see him. When we hear that, we as readers of the gospel are actually being directed back to Mark 1, verse 14. We need to go back to Galilee, back to the humble beginning of the gospel and the humble mundane characters who inhabit it to see it all with new eyes. Once we've been to the cross toward which Jesus uh, is going all through the gospel and the place that Mark points us to through his gospel, and once we've seen the victory of God at the empty tomb, we go back to Galilee. And all of it stands for to realize anew that this is just the place that Jesus has redeemed. Victory of Easter that, G that the angel proclaims in Mark 16 directs us back to Galilee to realize that the cosmic victory 
is always finally a local victory. It comes to Galilee and all who live there. It's a gospel and victory for them, for fisher folk, and for every last one of us. So brothers and sisters, in response to the word of God this morning, talking about the beginning of Jesus' gospel ministry and his calling of the first disciples, the question we need to ask ourselves today is this very simple but important one. How are we answering Jesus' call? Like Jesus, Jesus calls us to announce the good news of God's kingdom. He's passing that word on to us now, just as he passed it on to his apostles and his first followers. Like Simon, Andrew, James, and John, Jesus calls us too to fish for people. And there are many ways that we can carry out Jesus' call right where we are, right in what we're doing now. Steve Banks had a remarkably simple idea for reaching out to his neighbors. He decided to put a patio in his front yard. A 2009 Chicago Tribune article showed a picture of adults relaxing on chairs on a small patio under shade trees near a suburban street. Some kids were there too. Barbara Brotman, the writer of the column, said it would have been charming but unremarkable if it had been in their backyard, the usual spot for patios, but this patio was in their front yard. According to the 2009 article, the front yard patio became like a friendship magnet for Mr. Banks' neighbors, especially when Steve had set out a fire pit and built a bonfire. So people began to wander over, sit down and talk. It was so easy and low-key. No invitation required. If you saw people out there, you joined them. Steve called his patio the conversation curve. And he told the paper that his goal was fishing for people. A year later, almost to the day, Ms. Brotman wrote a follow-up article. Apparently, Keith Speaks from Hammond, Indiana, read the story and immediately called Banks to discuss his fishing for people front yard patio concept. He speaks works in community development, and he wanted to use the concept to build friendships in his town. So Speak started the Please Have a Seat program, which gives grants for homeowners to create microparks in their front yards. Follow-up article in 2010 described the unveiling ceremony for some of those microparks. Reverend Stephen Gibson, whose church has two benches of its own, gave a benediction. I ask God to bless this church as a symbol, this bench as a symbol of the spirit of welcome, he said. Showing hospitality to neighbors by visiting them in your yard or home is certainly one way to fulfill Jesus' calling, which of course will be safer once this pandemic is over. We can do it now by calling our neighbors and checking on how they're doing during this time of COVID. We can encourage neighbors, friends, and family to watch our worship services and live stream and YouTube. As I mentioned regularly, we can donate food and volunteer at the Bridge Youth Center, our main outreach to the community. We can invite neighbors and friends to join us at our church Bible studies and invite their children and grandchildren to come to GEMS and cadets. Ministry that I've done in past churches that we may want to consider is to have a seeker's Bible study where people from the community can come and ask questions about the Christian faith over a meal. The Alpha Course and Christianity Explored are two evangelistic Bible studies that I've led that we could do here at First Church as well when the time is right. And we can all continue to show our neighbors, friends, family, and co-workers who Jesus is with our testimonies and way of life. Let's continue to do in Zealand and in our own neighborhoods what Jesus and his disciples did in Galilee. Brothers and sisters, let's answer Jesus' call to fish for people right where we are as God's kingdom continues to come. Amen. Let's pray. 
Father, we are so grateful for the spread of the gospel. This gospel of the good news of your coming kingdom that, that started out very small with John the Baptist preaching about it and then Jesus preaching about it and how he was able to pass on that message to his apostles to share and to his followers to share all through the centuries right up to today. And that we too have the privilege of sharing that good news with those around us. And we're grateful, Father, for the call that Jesus gave to his first followers, to Simon, Andrew, James, and John. Now that was the precursor of uh, eight other disciples, eight other apostles being called by Jesus, and uh, many other followers besides, right up until now. Father, thank you that we too can respond to the call of Jesus to share the gospel, to share the good news of the kingdom in creative ways, certainly by our words and by our life, and also with opportunities to reach out to our neighbors in ways that show your love, in ways that share your message of who Jesus is for the world. God, we pray that you would open our eyes to opportunities to continue to share that message and to respond to Jesus' call in our lives here and now. And Lord, in fact, may that gospel continue to spread just as it spread in Galilee and now is spreading right here in Zealand and throughout West Michigan and the world. Bless us, Lord, to that call and to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's respond to God's word and to the call of Jesus Christ as we sing a song together that I think is new to most of us, or it's not one we've sung very often. It's, Will You Come and Follow Me? And because it is a new song, I will be singing the first couple verses, and I invite you to join me as we sing the final verse and the final chorus. And let's stand as we sing the Lord. Brothers and sisters, go out from here, fulfilling Jesus' call to share the good news of Jesus and to show that his kingdom has come. Go out with his, go out with his blessing and his call in your lives. God says to us, may the God of peace, 
through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.